favorite class. I was just, uh, you saw me on camera there, you know, spitting out some fire about Michael Jackson. So don't worry, it wasn't about the election, even though that's also crazy. Um, announcements. Get your homework done by Friday. RAR. If you're in the non-torsion lab and you have it due tomorrow, make sure you do that. Um, there will be no formal lab meeting tomorrow. I'll be around in the meeting if you want to come and maybe ask homework questions or whatever. That's perfectly fine. I'll be available if you want to pop in there. Otherwise, no formal meeting for lab tomorrow. Reminder, you will have your second exam for the class next week. I've posted practice problems for exam number two on Blackboard, as well as the full solutions. I've also posted a mock homework number eight, which will be ungraded. Also, the solutions for that on Blackboard, that's on fatigue, which we're talking about right now. So there won't be any fatigue questions on exam number two, but I promise you there'll be a fatigue question on the final. There you go. Okay, questions. Jesse, is it a common final? No, there is no common final for this class. I will write the test and I will grade the test. It will be 10 questions with very basic, what I think you need to know about mechanics. So you'll have like a buckling question. You'll have a 3D principal stress question. You'll have strain transformation question, blah, blah, blah. The 10 topics which I laid out in that email from a couple of days ago, which I think are the important topics from this class. And it's not going to be like, 45 minutes of you know workout problems for each problem. It's going to be very basic problem. Can you do, can you do it or can you not do it? Do you understand it or do you not understand it? Each problem shouldn't take you more than five minutes. I hope. Okay, so that's the idea for the for the final. It's not a common final. I'm going to test you on what I think are the important bits. Other questions. I'm 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 jacked up today. I'm psyched. All right. I'm just you know trying to contain my political emotion here because I got to keep it out of the classroom. All right. How do we like the meme today? Hitting a little too close to home? Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> that was submitted by Preston Smith. If anybody knows Preston, he's in my composites class and he submitted this meme with his last homework. <laughs> so blame him. <laughs> OK, probably the controls class when I understand. All right, let's get back to the notes. Last time we introduced fatigue. And we were um, sort of talking about the general model, but the model of fatigue that we're going to go with here is a constant sinusoidal um, stress. And we sort of made a model of what this sinusoidal applied stress is going to be as a function of time. And here is my applied stress on the piece. It could be from tension, compression. It could be from bending. It could be from torsion. Right here, I'll just give it some just generic sigma value, even though it could be a torsional, it could be a normal, etc. Uh, and we drew something that looked like this as our sort of like applied sinusoidal stress. All right, here, this was the mean stress, sigma m. It's so mean. Here, this was the stress amplitude, sigma sub a. Uh, and we also had the stress range, which was like this guy here, which we called sigma r. It's basically two times the amplitude. And we said that like, period of this applied sinusoid has a time which is nt and the number of cycles at any particular time was given with n. All right. And the first kind of thing that we looked at for fatigue was the stress life method. Well, we talked about a couple of variety of methods for analyzing pieces, but we had three methods. That was stress life, strain life, and linear elastic fracture mechanics. And we focus on stress life method. Okay. The basis of the stress life method is the RR Moore high speed test.
and we talked about this last time. It was a test that basically gives you that fluctuating stress um, with some rotational sample. So we had this concept here where we had some sample, some round sample, round cross section. We're spinning this guy with some motor. And we put this into four point bend. OK. That creates a constant moment in this region. If you're looking at your sort of shear and bending moment diagrams, you'd have a constant moment in this region for four point bend. And that creates in this portion of the cross section here. Alternating tension and compression on the top and bottom sides. So these points here are going through alternating tension and compression. And zero mean stress. OK. And by varying the load in your four point bend situation, right? So if each one of these is like P on two. By varying the load in your four point bend setup, you can induce different levels of moment, which will induce different tensile and compressive stresses in the cross section and give you varying amplitudes of your stress. So. Very applied load P to induce higher or lower values of the stress amplitude sigma A. OK, that's the basis for our test. We're rotating this guy while it's under four point bend. This cross section here is going through this fluctuating tension, compression, tension, compression as it sort of spins around. And we're going to count the number of rotations that it takes before this thing fails. And we call this an F, number of cycles to failure. The idea here then is we want to plot how many cycles of failure are required for varying levels of stress amplitude. OK, the more aggressive your stress amplitude, the less cycles to failure you would expect for your fatigue. Right, so this is the basis for what's called the endurance curve. OK, and we uh, were talking about this at the very end of lecture last time. And I just want to sort of drive this endurance curve home a little bit. So we have the independent variable on the Y axis, which to me makes no sense, but is the way that it's traditionally done. And the dependent variable on the X axis, which again, silly. But typically, number of cycles to failure will be on the X axis. And the stress amplitude will be on the Y axis. We imagine that if we apply the ultimate tensile strength on the piece, that we're going to fail with zero cycles, basically, or one cycle, if you want to think of it that way. Basically, very, very close to zero cycles. So the first data point on this endurance curve would be basically here, where this is the ultimate tensile strength, usually denoted with sigma u. Or your book, your Shigley book, uses a, a different, um, this is meant to be a comma, a different nomenclature. They use the capital S for strength instead of sigma u. So your Shigley book uses capital S U T, the strength, ultimate strength and tension, S U T. It's a little bit strange, but the Shigley book kind of has its own nomenclature. 
their unique snowflakes there at Jiggly. OK, so they got to kind of do their own thing, whatever. All right, so as we decrease the stress amplitude that we're putting on this guy, meaning we're sort of like decreasing the amount of force, we would expect more cycles to failure um, inside of the piece. And so as you sort of go down and decrease the applied amplitude, you would expect more cycles to failure in fatigue. And that's generally what we see. So it usually looks something like this. This is all, these are all data points. All right. And with some, you know, it's modeled as linear, usually decrease for stress amplitude as a function of number of cycles to failure. Um, sorry, linear with uh, powers of 10. So it's actually uh, logarithmic. And in this early sort of category, we're applying stresses that are above that which would cause yield. So here, if we say that this stress amplitude value is like sigma y, or your book calls it sy, the yield stress, that's here. We're applying a stress amplitude sort of above yield, but below the ultimate tensile strength. We're in situation of low cycle fatigue, LCF, which we talked about last time. It's that very aggressive bending of the plastic on the top of the pencil that I sort of showed last time. Inducing plasticity with each particular cycle. Right. This is usually sort of at the ultimate between ultimate and yield strength, you're sort of getting to the end of um, low cycle fatigue, approaching the stress amplitude being yield stress around like a thousand cycles or 10,000 cycles. So about a thousand or 10,000 kind of depends on the material. All right, you can continue this and you'll have a different sort of a slope which occurs here now in this general region which would now be the region where you're not inducing any plasticity with your applied stress amplitude, but you just have a lot of elastic loading. And this here is high cycle fatigue. All right. <clears throat> the boundary here um, for number of cycles to failure uh, in the high cycle fatigue, it's really variable, but somewhere in the 1 million to 10 million range. One million to 10 million, all right? Then we said that there was some stress amplitude that you could apply to your piece that was so low that you could induce that stress over and over and over and over and over and your piece would never fail, okay? So we call that level, that value, right where you're transitioning from a state where you could apply infinite cycles to failure and that state where you could not apply infinite cycles to failure. We call this the endurance limit, and that's typically given with a stress amplitude of SE. Okay, so more or less like beyond this line here that defines the endurance limit. In this region, stress amplitude so low. will never fail. OK, that's the idea. I forget, did you guys talk about this in material science, endurance curves or not? A little bit? Kind of? I'm getting like the uh, windmill head. We talked about it. We didn't talk about it. I don't know, what does that mean? <laughs> it's the windmill head. All right. So for steels, there is an endurance limit, but not every material has this endurance limit. Some examples of materials that do not have an endurance limit are like Um, I think like some brasses do also. Uh, we're kind of approaching the edge of my knowledge for uh, for fatigue. I, I'm not I'm not sort of like a metals expert, and usually you talk about um, fatigue with metals, obviously. 
but not every uh, material has an endurance limit. So aluminum is an example of a material that does not have an endurance limit. This curve will keep going down and down and down and down and down and will go out kind of forever. You'll never have some situation where it plateaus off with some endurance limit, okay? So I wanted to pull in, these are from the notes, some endurance curves for some materials that are well known. So here are some examples. All right. This first one right from the notes is kind of a, a baseline for steel, which is uh, kind of the, the most common. So here's an example. I'm not going to try to draw this because, you know, suspicious. Whoa, why did that like, why did that displace my underlining of examples? There we go. So here's an example for, I think this is just kind of a arbitrary steel. I'm not sure which steel this is. Oh, it's for G41,300 steel. Okay. Honestly, I don't even know that designation. That's not an ANSI designation, it's something else. But here we see kind of the values that I'm talking about. Here's the ultimate tensile strength of this piece, right? So under, the ultimate tensile strength being applied in sort of like this cyclic fashion, you would expect like basically zero or one cycles to failure. And then as you start decreasing the amount of stress amplitude which apply, you apply, you start to see that you're increasing the number of cycles to failure, all right? Um, so this transition here between low cycle and high cycle, like I said, is occurring right around the 1000 cycles to failure number. And this kind of varies by material, all right? So where you sort of transition from low cycle to high cycle fatigue, it really depends. It could be a thousand, could be 10,000, could be you know, less or more than that even. It really kind of varies, but here's an example. Then high cycle fatigue kind of all the way out here, um, kind of past this 1000 cycles to failure number. And we start to see what the actual endurance limit is here for this particular piece. So these experiments basically are being done with stress amplitudes here that are like, I don't know, that looks like maybe 45 or so KSI. Um, and what they're saying here is with these arrows, they're kind of to the right of the data point here, um, is that it's somewhere beyond what this data point is showing to the right. All right. So they gave up the test at this particular point, which was 10 to the seventh. I guess that would be 10 million cycles. They gave up the test, they got tired and they went home and they said, all right, we went out to 10 million cycles and then we threw in the towel. So it's gonna fail somewhere past that. And you know, maybe it's not even gonna fail past that, right? That's what that data point is trying to show. And so the idea here is we're applying these sorts of stress amplitudes and they're saying, all right, we're getting to this endurance limit. We're gonna do a hundred million tests. And after that, like our machine's tired, it needs oil. Okay, we gotta stop. So they're reaching this like plateau value. And that means if you're sort of designing for fatigue, you probably want to design for fatigue in this particular range. So the amplitude of your stress, even if you go through 100 million cycles, you're never going to fail by, by fatigue. So it's kind of a good design guideline. OK, some other examples. You know, I want to pull in one here for one that does not have an endurance limit. So these are a couple of more pieces of, um, these are a couple more endurance curves that are of importance. And again, like I said, like fatigue is all empirical, <laughs> you know, it's experiments that people have done many, many times over the years. So here are a couple more endurance curves. This one's for A15 steel. So again, another steel material. The ultimate strength of this guy is given as 820 MPA. So that's kind of like up here somewhere and maybe more like here. Okay, so there's your ultimate strength for this particular guy. So these experiments were done at various percentages of that ultimate strength, okay? So maybe this one was done at like 750 MPA put on that machine. This one was done at like 710. These guys here done at 650, these guys done at 600, et cetera. So tests with that applied stress amplitude on that machine and they're building this endurance on that information, 
Okay. And they start to see it sort of plateau at this value here of 414 MPA, which they're assigning as the endurance limit. So these particular people are saying, all right, we see this plateau value here around 400. I, I mean, they're being very precise saying 414. And, you know, they got some values out here that are, you know, all under the endurance limit. But, okay, sure, 414, that's the number. It's like when they stamp the number on the milk. Jesse. Yeah, so you're still in a condition of no elasticity or no plasticity. So even in this range down here, um, with your applied stress, you still have no plasticity that's occurring. So you would still consider this high cycle fatigue because it's only elastic response in the material. So the question is, am I still in the high cycle fatigue range? Even in this like range of stresses, the answer is yes, you're only applying elastic contributions. OK, <clears throat> so uh, yeah. 414 MPA, they stamp it right on there. It's like when you buy milk and they put on the date like, you know, August 14th, that's the day that your milk will be bad. You're like, okay, it's like I have some leeway. I'm going to smell it a little bit. It's probably fine. Okay. That's how you got to take this 414 MPA. There's probably some leeway. If you're at 415, I don't know. It smells okay to me. Like, let's, let's see. All right. So this is for steel A517. We can compare that to 7075 aluminum. And you see this aluminum doesn't really have any plateau. This guy is still sort of continuing and trending downward. And aluminum will just continue to sort of trend downward like this indefinitely. It doesn't have an endurance limit. And uh, aluminum just generally doesn't. OK, so that's an example here. OK, so hopefully that, that gives you a general idea. Now, I have to remind you here that all of the data that you've seen in these endurance curves is for very pristine samples that were done in a laboratory, prepared in a laboratory. They polished the surface up all nice. They were all of a very similar size and everything was perfect. Okay. So we have to remind ourselves. All data above from laboratory specimens. That means all same surface finish. All same size. And all zero mean stress. OK, so if we just like brainstorm and think about some of this stuff, all right, all these samples are the same surface finish. What if I had a piece that had a worse surface finish, right? Where it like, you know, maybe had a nick or a scratch in it. What's that going to do? All right, well, that nick or scratch is going to induce some level of stress concentration or stress intensity. If you're talking fracture mechanics lingo, that's going to lead to earlier failure. So if your sample isn't like perfectly pristine and polished and it has a couple surface flaws, your endurance curve is going to change dramatically and it's basically going to shift downwards because you know, you're going to have less cycles to failure given some applied stress, all right? So that's important, okay? How do we deal with that? All right? Well, complicated. All right, they're all the same size. Well, what happens if we change the size of our piece? Well, you're going to change the surface area to volume ratio, right? The more surface area to volume that you have, the higher likelihood for flaws, the earlier failure is going to happen. Okay. So again, you have to somehow understand that if your geometry changes, your specimen dimensions change, your endurance curve will somehow change. Okay. So all of the stuff that we've seen so far is very pristine. And they're saying, yes, my endurance value, 414 MPA, that's the number. <laughs> right stamped it right on there okay well no because that's a perfectly pristine specimen with a particular size done in a laboratory polished up perfectly etc that doesn't happen in the real world okay 
like, yeah, you can do your best to prepare materials for the real world nicely. You can polish them, et cetera, but steel rusts, um, you know, hail happens and damages materials and whatever, okay? You got a bunch of other factors that you need to consider. So the point is, we need to make modifications to this endurance curve appropriately so that we can make predictions about the reality of the situations that we might have. Okay? So we need tools to predict how endurance curves will change given the following. Different cross sections. All right, we talked about like square cross sections versus circular cross sections and torsion. Um, what happens if they have different stress amplitudes and fatigue, for instance? You may want to consider that. So different cross sections, that's important. Different surface finish. Okay, this is like square versus circle. Different surface finish, um, surface area to volume ratio. So SA to volume ratio. So I'll just kind of shorthand this as dimensions. All right. The type of loading can matter. So we talked about sort of like putting this bending load on, but what about if we did like a torsional test? How's that gonna change things? What I mean by that is like axial bending. Torsion. All right, so an axial fatigue would be something like, you know, fatiguing a piece like this. A bending fatigue would be like what I did with my pencil tab, just kind of like bending example, and what you see with the RR more test. And then what about torsion? Just kind of back and forth, like choo, 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 kind of torsional test. All right, we have to have the ability to modify these endurance curves to know about what stress we're going to fail given some alternate conditions like different size, different surface finish, different loading, et cetera. And so that's what we're going to talk about in the next set of notes. And that is lecture 11. And that's modifications to the endurance limit. Question, Mr. Jordan. Yep. The question is, why do we not consider temperature for our fatigue analysis? And the answer is because we don't have time in this class. Otherwise, we would. Jordan brings up a good point. Materials become more brittle when they cool down. Obviously, we live in Wisconsin. We know that. My you know, tolerance for temperature is more brittle in the winter. OK, so uh, I hear that. So if a material is more brittle, it has a uh, more higher likelihood to fail earlier, right? So yes, temperature is also important. We're going to talk about generally that sort of method for attacking that but accommodating temperature and fatigue is really complicated okay what we're talking about right now is already pretty complicated but accommodating for temperature as well even more so okay outside the scope of this class and that's just because like the embrittlement of various materials just varies so much with temperature it's really hard to to give a, a very wide overarching like view um, before we move on i want to just so, show some cool pictures like from your book um, you know, don't don't have to like draw these or whatever. I just think that these are kind of cool pictures. So this first one here is like a fatigue failure surface for um, a bolt. Um, and it's repeated unidirectional bending. OK, so what that means is it's doing like this kind of thing. Choo, 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 choo. And it's really interesting that at point A, you start to have this sort of like failure, which is happening. So point A up here is sort of where the failure initiated. Maybe there was some small nick or you know something is happening where failure is beginning to initiate okay 
And now you're bending this thing constantly through some sort of like maybe applied load that's kind of transverse to this guy. I don't know. I, I don't exactly know. But you see this like ring structure, which is kind of cool. Why does this like mouse thing not work? Okay. So you see this like ring structure that it kind of looks like a, you cut open a tree trunk. The idea here is that you're applying bending, applying bending, and with every single like applied bending load that you introduce, you're cutting open or fracturing this material open a little bit at a time. Okay, so every single load that you go through, you see this new like hackle mark, this new sort of surface that's created every single time that you're opening that crack just a little bit, it's progressing, progressing, progressing. And so you're failing through this material, failing through, failing through, and then it's like Popeye. I had all I can stands, I can't stands no more, okay? It's just like, I don't have enough material left on my bolt to handle the stresses that are on this, so I just, I'm done, okay? I fail all the way through. So you have this like progressive opening failure until you reach this point and then it just bang, sudden very dynamic failure kind of shooting through the remaining amount of material. Okay, final fracture at point C here it's talking about. So this is a nice picture from your book. Uh, another picture here, very similar occurrence. On the left hand side, you had some initiation and it's sort of like you see a very faint idea of like rings forming here, kind of moving left to right until all of a sudden you get to like this point right here where again, I had all I can stands, I can't stands no more. And it just bang, very sudden dynamic fracture. And you see this very rough surface here indicating that the path is trying to find the least resistance in a very dynamic way. And so it's trying to find like the grain boundaries that are giving it the least resistance as it's like moving very quickly through the failure. So here, the failure is very progressive and it looks much more clean because it's only going a little bit at a time and it has kind of this ability to just inch forward very slowly. But once it gets to this portion here, it's like, all right, ready or not, here I come. All right, bang. And it shoots through that sort of right-hand side there. So that's another kind of cool picture. And lastly, this is, this is a really interesting picture to me and that you have no indication from the outside of this failure occurring. On the other two samples, you had like nicks on the outside that maybe you'd be able to see visually or detect. But this one's really interesting. This is like a rod that's kind of being loaded and unloaded in cyclic tension. And there's some internal flaw that started like right here. You can sort of see this internal flaw here. This kind of looks like a hole or a nick or some void that might've been inside the material when it was manufactured. And it, the failure actually nucleated from this particular point outward, okay? And so we see the ring structure nucleating from the inside out as this thing is loaded, maybe it like gives a little bit more internal failure until it reaches this point here where again, it's, you know, I had all I can stands, I can't stands no more. And it just erupts outward in failure. And again, this is very dangerous because the failure is occurring on the inside. You wouldn't have any indication looking at this piece from the outside that it's, that it's like failing. Okay. So this internal nucleation and spreading from this point until it you know, it was basically doesn't have any more area in this large circle to handle the load. And it just says, all right, I'm done. I'm, I'm through. Too abusive, this relationship. I'm out. All right. And then it goes to the edge. So some pretty cool pictures of real failure. Okay. Want to keep your ink annotations? No, go away. All right. So we'll move on then to the next set of notes. Uh, and the next set of notes talks about modifications to endurance limit. Okay. <clears throat> so I think this is this is deck deck 10, yes? Deck 10. Yeah. Okay. How do I want to frame this? All right, so we saw a variety of endurance limits. All right, so re recall your sort of like endurance curve. And we'll say first, how does the endurance limit change with ultimate strength. Okay, 
So generally, if a material has a higher ultimate strength, you would expect it to ha have a higher endurance limit. Okay. And that just sort of like makes sense if you thought about like plotting two different materials on the same endurance curve, right? Maybe material one has a lower ultimate strength than material two. And so maybe material one looks something like this. And material two, similar idea, but plateaus off much earlier. Okay. So because it started at a higher location, you would expect this endurance limit, SE2. Here's SUT2. So material two obviously is starting at a higher location. So it ends at a higher location for its endurance limit. That's opposed to like material one, which might start at a lower ultimate strength. And obviously it ends here at a lower endurance limit. Right, so this is like material one and material two. If you start from a higher location, you'd expect to end at a higher location, just sort of intuitive, right? So how does the endurance limit change with ultimate strength? So the question is, can we test many different materials with the RR more high speed um, test and plot basically what is the endurance limit as a function of ultimate strength? So test many materials. with the various ultimate tensile strengths, SUT, and plot, uh, let's plot resulting endurance limits, SE. So again, this is done on you know, laboratory experiments. So R R more test. And you can plot this again, fatigue, all empirical. You just gotta plot stuff and you know, say this is what happens. So on the X axis here we have our ultimate tensile strength. S U T. And on the y-axis here, we have our endurance limit, which is SE. Right. So remember in your graph what we're looking at. This T and this is SE. This is number of cycles to failure. All right, that's your endurance curve just as a reminder. OK. If my ultimate tensile strength is 0, my endurance limit is 0. So it makes sense to start my graph here kind of in the lower left, all right? What people find is that as you increase the ultimate tensile strength, you increase the endurance limit in a linear fashion, okay? So this is for steels because steel has an endurance limit. So let's kind of just um, plot this for steels. People see this general trend here. until some point where it actually levels out. OK, this is kind of like what the data kind of shows. It's something that looks like this. And you got a bunch of like data and a bunch of scatter here. OK, it's not like all clear, but this is like approximately what you would expect. OK, this is like, you know, what the real data looks like. All right. And what the data kind of shows is that there's a linear region here that grows and grows and grows up to a point where things plateau. Okay. This linear region has a slope of about one half. So this slope here, we'll write that, um, let's see, how do I want to do this? SE is approximately equal to one half SUT. Okay. This plateau, 
from experiment occurs at about 200 KSI. I think the most recent like values that come out are, what do they say in the most recent chart? 212 KSI. So up to 212 KSI, your endurance limit is linear. It's about one half of the um, ultimate tensile strength. So kind of the Y value here that is you're reaching at this plateau is about 106. OK. Approximately. And, you know, the data here, it, it has sort of like an upper slope and a lower slope. So it's, it, you know, it's not exactly one half. They're kind of just doing the best that they can by sort of averaging all the data together. All right. But that's the general idea. So your endurance strength is increasing linearly as a function of your ultimate tensile strength at about a slope of one half. This results in sort of accepted charts and tables that tell you what your endurance limit is given some ultimate tensile strength. So results in something that looks like the following. This is right from your equation sheet. something that looks like this, All right? Um, can I blow this up a little? No, I cannot. How do I get like the pointer thing? Um, print preview, no, favorite highlight, touch mouse mode, that's what I want. Mouse. This is not the mouse, this is the pen. What the heck? Give me the mouse. Ah. All right, I give up. OK, so anyway, here's the idea. Your endurance limit goes approximately as one half the ultimate tensile strength. Which is kind of what I drew on the graph over there, the slope approximately one half, right? Here it's 0.504. OK, why they have the 04? OK, it's just what they've deemed to be the most accurate value. All right. And this is all good below ultimate tensile strengths of 212 KSI or 1460 MPa if you're in standard units. All right. Above 212 KSI, this chart is telling you that you've reached your plateau value and you're just going to assign that your endurance limit is 107 KSI. You're just going to say that it is the plateau value. All right. They've provided this additional piece of information for you in metric. But basically these two you know these two portions of the gra these two portions of the table are the same it's the same information those two guys right so for steels this is the generally accepted information and we could do this with other materials and people have done this so other materials and that is here What, what, why, why did you go over there? Yeah, God, sometimes. <laughs> All right, so here's the idea for iron. For iron, the slope of the endurance limit as a function of ultimate tensile strength is more like 0.4 instead of 0.5. So that's kind of the accepted value here. And your plateau value for the ultimate tensile strength is not 212, but now it's 60 KSI, All right? And the endurance limit plateau is, you know, 24 KSI in this situation. It is 0.4 times 60. Hopefully that sort of makes sense. Now, these materials here, these are materials that do not generally have an endurance limit. All right. 
So instead of reporting like an endurance limit, what is reported in your figure here is like, it's still alive at 500 million cycles. We're basically going to call that, you know, the value of infinite life. Okay. So here, chart uses n equals 500 million as endurance value. And so we see that here. When n equals 500 million, what value of stress would cause that to be right at the boundary of failure and safety, all right? This is the same general idea. So aluminum, copper, no general endurance limit, but they say, okay, if you reach 500 million cycles without failing, we'll call that your endurance limit. Okay, so let's quickly do some calculation examples and then we'll get you out of here for today. All right, so let's do some examples quickly. So find the endurance limit for, first we'll do steel. With an ultimate tensile strength of 400, 147 KSI. We'll do a steel with an ultimate tensile strength of 243 KSI. And we'll do iron with an ultimate tensile strength of 60 KSI. OK, so let's look at this guy first. An ultimate tensile strength of 147 KSI. Basically, to determine the endurance limit, I'm going to go up to my chart here. 147, that's less than 212. So my endurance limit for this particular piece is just going to be 0 0.504 times that ultimate tensile strength. And so here the answer is 147 times 0 0.504. Or here, this is just going to be 74. 0.1 KSI. All right, approximately 50% of that value. This guy here, if I want to check the ultimate tensile strength of steel with 243 KSI, all right, I'll go back up to my chart. 243 is greater than 212. Thank you, Miss, you know, Adam Check from first grade. That was my first grade teacher. All right, so since 243 is greater than 212, then we just take the plateau value for our endurance limit, which is 107 KSI. And that's it, no calculation required. Finally, my iron was 60 KSI. Ultimate tensile strength will go up here and check my value for iron. Okay, I'm right on this boundary. I can basically take either one, it's gonna give me the same value. But here, if it's greater than or equal to 60 KSI, which is kind of what I have here, then I'll just take the plateau value, which is 24 KSI for my endurance limit. Okay, so that's that. Finding endurance limit giving, given various ultimate tensile strengths for a variety of different materials. That's sort of step number one in your analysis of fatigue. All right, so that'll be it for today. Uh, we'll continue this discussion on Friday.